Book of Hebrews chapter 2 tonight, church. If you're there, we're going to read it together. And it's going to be chapter 2, verses 14 to 18 tonight. And um, the title of the message is going to be, Is Your Life Prophetic? What does that mean, is your life prophetic? You say, I'm a, I'm a prophet. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, that, I'm, we're not interested in, in what you're saying about that. What we are interested in is the fact that, uh, and, and there's, there's a little bit of sarcasm with this title, is your life prophetic? Uh, that question is put forth to get you to think, uh, to conclude and to discover that the answer is, yes, it is. Your life is prophetic, meaning, as we'll see tonight in our study, that your life is not comprised of everything that you've achieved or who you are to this moment, but there's a future that lies ahead. In fact, everything that's gone on in your life thus far has only been preparatory for your future. And if you're an atheist, you're preparing for your future. Your, your life is prophetic if you're an atheist. It's true. Your life is prophetic if you're a believer. That is true. And we're going to hear reasons why. And I pray tonight that for many of you, which is a lot in this church, that have had a Catholic upbringing, that from this moment on, there's a great a blessing that comes to you from the word of God, of hope, of excitement, because from here on out, you're going to be hearing a lot about the, the main purpose of the book of Hebrews, and that is Jesus Christ is the one and only priest that you need in life. Amen. And that's good news. That's good news. Hebrews chapter 2, I'll begin reading in verse 14. If you'll pick up in the odd numbered verses, verse 15 for you, and we begin here. Uh, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, speaking of us, we have, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he, that's Jesus, might destroy him, that is Satan, who had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 16, for indeed he does not, it should say not, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That's an amazing verse. Verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. That's us. Amen. Father, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people again said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So is your life prophetic? Uh, G.K. Chesterton wrote, whatever else is or is not true, this one thing is certain. Man is not what he was meant to be. That is a powerful truth and a powerful statement. In fact, according to God's word, his message to us throughout the Bible is a message of redemption and salvation because you and I are not who we were created to be. That you and I today live a life even if we are very tight with Jesus tonight, it is still a life uh, by which that sin has brought us to the place where we're at, that God created Adam and Eve to live in such a way that what you and I endure, the original creation was never to be like that. And we need to remember that, that whatever man is, we are not, and this is a, I mean, th that's an encouraging word, that we are not what God made us to be. In other words, we look to the future. And I'm going to give you some lead in to all of this. Asking that question, is your life prophetic? Very much so. Listen up, church. John chapter 5, verse 24. Strong statement regarding the future. Most, most assuredly, Jesus says, I say to you that he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. That's a prophetic statement. And shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. That's a prophetic statement. 
Verse 25, most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Amen. That's a prophetic statement. Amen. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Amen. Verse 27, and has given him authority to execute judgment also. Because he is the son of man. That means Jesus is the preeminent man. Uh, with all due respect, let me put it to you this way. Jesus being the son of man, he picks up where Adam dropped the ball. Amen. When it says Jesus is the son of man. He's the representative of perfect mankind. He is our prototype, is a word that you could use. Verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. And come forth, listen, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and to those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Isn't that powerful? Next uh, portion of scripture is found in uh, the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12, 1 says, at that time, this is futuristic, this is prophetic. What we're about to read has not yet happened. It's going to happen. At that time, it's during the tribulation period, Michael, that's the archangel, shall stand up, the great prince who stands over a watch over the sons of your people, that is Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered. This is the word to Daniel. He's very old now. He's near uh, the end of his life. And this word is being spoken to him. Everyone who is found written in the book. Wow. Yeah, the book of life. By the way, side note. If you don't get your book, if you don't get your name written in the Lamb's book of life, your name gets blotted out of the book of life. To keep your name written in the book of life, you've got to get it written in the Lamb's book of life. The books are open and the names are looked for. And when a name is blotted out from among the living, it's blotted out because that name is not found in the Lamb's book of life. So to get to heaven, your name's got to be in the book of life. And Daniel's hearing about it here now. Well, how, how do I make sure my name is in the book of life? You got, good, you should ask that question. Every single one of us should ask that question. And the answer is, make sure that it's in the Lamb's book of life. What does that mean? To keep it in God's book, make sure, you make, make sure that you put it in the book of the Lamb. That is Jesus, the Lamb of God. How does that happen? By accepting Christ. That's how you keep your name in the book of life. Does that make sense? Did I confuse you? Everybody needs to know that. You don't want to find that out later. For sure. Verse 2, and many of those who sleep, or those who have died, in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Notice both those passages, Old and New Testament, say the exact same thing. There's going to be a resurrection of all those who have lived, some to damnation and some to eternal life. Those who have done good, those who have done bad. Say, so what is good and what is bad? Very simple. It's not based upon works. The good and the bad is based upon who's your priest? Who's your salvation? Who's your Messiah? That's what determines you to be good. Good is reserved for God. God imparts the label, the title, the banner as it was over you as good. The Bible says there's only one good and that is God. But by faith in Christ, you are then recorded as being righteous. That's an amazing thing. God declares that. Amen. And this ought to get our attention. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27 and 28, listen to this. Listen carefully, my friends. And as it is appointed for men, that is mankind, to die once. You're only going to die once. Okay. So that throws out reincarnation. There's no reincarnation in the Bible. That's a pagan belief. The Bible says you die once. But after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 
He died for the sins of the world, but only the many who believe profit from what he did. Are you with me? Watch this. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Meaning this, that what he's announcing to us is the fact that you want to make sure that your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life, that Jesus Christ is your priest, and that what we're looking at in the book of Hebrews applies to you, that you've got it. And we're going to talk about that tonight. Is your life prophetic? Number one, jot it down if you would. It's in verse 14, and number one is this. Have you met Jesus Christ for real? That's the question that is really the answer to what's being put forth in verse 14. He says there in chapter 2, verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, stop right there, the author of the book is talking about the children of God who have become children of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch what he says, and this is very comforting to us. He announces that the children that we're talking about have partaken of flesh and blood. Raise your hand, everybody. Just raise your hand. I don't care which hand it is. Okay, that means you. You and I, he's announcing, the Bible is, and you know this, that you and I have partaken of this life called flesh and blood. This is where you and I live. You say, well, obviously, this is ridiculous. Wait a minute, we're going somewhere. Because it's one thing to understand that you and I live in this world, and you know what? Um, what's, what's the old saying? You know, uh, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He who dies with the most toys wins. Uh, look out for number one. If that is your worldview, uh, then you have partaken of flesh and blood, and that's all you live for. You have a self-centered, egotistical, hedonistic life, uh, and it's all about pleasure. And that you're going to grab all the fun, you can. And so that's you. And I hope that's not you, but I'm just saying that's you. And uh, versus understanding that the children, notice this, the announcement is, whoever we're speaking of, they are children. We know from the context that they're the children of God. I trust that's you. But the children of God have partaken of flesh and blood. Why is that important? Because we're going to learn in a moment that the reason why Jesus Christ stands out and far away from all others, be it a priest, be it an evangelist, be it Billy Graham, be it the Pope, be it uh, whoever, it doesn't matter who it is. Um, who's the guy running around? He says he's God. Uh, Dalai Lama. He's, he's a God on earth, according to him. No, 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 listen. The children of God have partaken of flesh and blood. And we're going to learn that Jesus Christ, our salvation, what makes him so unique for us in the book of Hebrews and in life is the fact that he didn't come in any other fashion but that of a human. And these things to us could be so mundane that we can lose the power and the significance. You're going to hear about it soon. He did not come as an angel. Jesus did not die for angels. And in fact, what he did was he went from being the creator of angels and he went around the angelic world as it was and went down, stooped down so low that he entered into humanity, us as fallen creatures. And that God created us in his image, and that cannot be said of angels. Angels are holy spirits. When I say holy, I mean W-H, holy. They are completely spirit. What God did is that he who is spirit became flesh because we're flesh. He came into this world to associate with us. And the question is, have you met Jesus Christ for real? It's very important. Listen, if you believe this or not, this next statement is true nonetheless, and it's this, that your future, prophetically speaking, is bound up in something or in someone at this very moment. That's a fact. You think about that for a moment. If it's Christ, then it's Jesus. If you're a Christian, then you're a follower of his. If you're an atheist, then it's you. You're the captain of your own ship. But whatever you believe and hold to, it's prophetic. In other words, it's got a destination to it. So be careful what it is that you believe. You see the word right here, inasmuch? That word means because or since. 
Since these things, since the children have been partakers of flesh and blood, that is a comforting declaration because it means there and it implies that God did not leave us alone to be lost forever. Aren't you glad about that? It's amazing. And so the word partaken or to partake of is this word that means to us here that we would be uh, ones that contribute in this humanity of ours, that you and I as humans in procreation, uh, we have children and God is going to be telling us that he has children too. But it's not by the means obviously by which we operate in this world, but that God moves in the spirit. And it's the infinite wisdom and the design of God, which is amazing, that you and I are called children. We are obviously children born to this world, but what counts and what lasts forever is being a child of God. And please, dear friend, you can get upset with me if you'd like, but please work this out. You are not automatically a child of God. I know in a poetic world, in a hallmark kind of world, it's, 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 it's comforting, you know, it seems... It seems like some stately uh, grandmother type figure pats you on the head and says, oh, we're all, we're just all children of God. Have you heard that before? The Bible says that's not true. The Bible says, uh, the Bible says that is not true. The Bible says there are two families in this world. And look, I'll, Jesus said it, so I'll just quote him. Jesus said that if you're not a believer, you are of your father, the devil. Say, Jesus said that. Jesus said that. But to be in his family, to be a child of God, is to know him. Amen. Is to turn to him and to look to him. But according to the Bible, you and I have been created altogether different. Now, my friends, listen up now. According to the Bible, you and I have been created in the image of God. And I mentioned a, a couple of weeks ago, or whenever that was, that it is true that the elements that make up the universe is what makes us up because we were formed out of the dust of the earth. That is a scientific fact. But what's very important for us to understand is that you don't want to categorize yourself as, self as many do as animals. Oh, you, man is an animal. You know why people say that? They, they say it because either A, they want that to be true because they don't want to believe in God or they're being a little sloppy about what they're saying. We were created by the same designer, the same architect and engineer. You understand, right? It's God. The fingerprints of God is in the DNA and is in the engineering of everything that he has made. His fingerprints are on all this stuff. That makes sense. But regarding you, you are not an animal. People will say we're animals if they don't believe in God. But listen, God created all things, including us, but we are the only ones by which he created us in his image. You have a spirit. Animals do not have a spirit. The Bible says they have a soul, but not a spirit. Ecclesiastes. You think about that for a moment. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him as the one who calls you his child? or his son, or his daughter. And this is very critical to this study. And so it says in verse 14 going on, it says there that likewise uh, shared in the same, that Jesus Christ shared in the same, that he became flesh just like us. Remarkable. He, the, and, and the meaning of this, I don't know, uh, some of your margins in your study Bibles may say this, but the word likewise simply means uh, togetherness, that Jesus came and shared in the togetherness, the alongsideness, or the unity of oneness with us, that he came into this world. Verse 14 goes on that through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. According to the Bible, listen up everybody, Jesus Christ, listen carefully, according to the Bible, Jesus Christ destroyed the power of the devil and he destroyed the power of the devil by destroying death. Listen, you see, well, people die all the time. Yes, they do, but that's not the death we're interested in. That is not the big death. But Christ came took upon himself human skin 
and shared in the same that he might experience death because you and I experience death. But watch this. He destroyed him, that is Satan, the devil, who had the power of death. According to the Bible right here and now, church, the authority of Satan regarding death has been taken away from him. This is a true biblical fact. You say, well, wait a minute, people are still dying. Yes, and people will die. What we're saying is, what the scripture is teaching, that Jesus, when he went to the cross, died and rose again from the dead. In other words, when he did that, the keys to hell were taken away from Satan. The power that Adam and Eve handed him, Jesus, in his resurrection, took that power back. And Satan has been nullified. Now he runs around threatening, he runs around accusing, but the, listen, the presence of sin in this world is why there's still death. If Satan had his way, we would all be dead right now. But he doesn't have that authority anymore. That's good news. I want to play something for you. Bertrand Russell, some of us had to study him in school or read him in school. Uh, interesting guy, mathematician, philosopher, thinker, uh, highly respected in the atheistic world or in the thinking world for that matter. It's, but Bertrand Russell was a man who was known for his intellect. The world looked to him. A lot of his uh, mathematical uh, disciplines are studied even still to this day. But Bertrand Russell... Um, said something, and we have it on video. It's, it's very old, and it's going to be hard to hear, but I want, I want you guys to watch this and listen carefully, please. One last question. Suppose, Lord Russell, this film were to be looked at by our descendants like a Dead Sea Scroll in a thousand years' time. What would you think it's worth telling that generation about the life you've lived and the lessons you've learned from it? I should like to say two things. One intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say to them is this. When you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what, what the is facts? the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would wish to believe or by what you think would have beneficent social effects if it were believed. But look only and solely at what are the facts. That is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say to them is very simple. I should say, love is wise, hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected. We have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things that we don't like. We can only live together in that way. And if we are to live together and not die together, we must learn a kind of charity and a kind of tolerance which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet. Wow. So, secondly, he said, be loving, be kind, be tolerant of one another. Don't, right? Don't hate one another. All right? This is a famous atheist. Where did that come from in his mind? It's like he's paraphrasing scripture. But the first thing that he said was don't let what you want to believe be what you believe. Don't go with what you feel. Go with the facts. Amen. And Bertrand Russell, in his last words, he says, brief and powerless, this is man's life on him and on all his race. The slow, sure doom falls, pitless and dark, and he died an atheist. His one and two arguments were the primary arguments of Scripture. They are the primary arguments of Scripture. Love one another and follow the facts. Amen. Think about that for a moment. 
The poor man failed at both. And yet he had an intellect that far exceeds all of ours. And he is still read and looked to today. No, if we follow the facts, according to Bertrand Russell, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that he also presented himself, that's Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them, by his disciples, apostles, and others, during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. The Bible says that he was revealing himself by many infallible proofs. The Bible says of itself that Jesus showed up after his death and resurrection and you could prove it. That's quite a statement, church, right there. Do you believe that or do you not believe that? You need to make a decision on that. Meeting Jesus Christ matters because the Bible announces to us that it is our God, it is our Christ who came into this world and took upon himself our humanity that he might associate with us because we are the ones that suffer through death and pain and sorrow and that he did that. And that the very threat that terrifies us constantly apart from Christ is this thing about death. And according to the Bible, Jesus Christ took the authority and the power away from Satan regarding death. Church, that's an amazing statement. Because the Bible makes this very, very clear. That Christ disabled the powers of darkness. There is no pope, there is no priest, there is no pastor or an evangelist that can offer that. We go directly to him. We cry out to him. We speak to him because he's the one that paid the price. He's the one that has invited us to come directly to him. He's the only one that can relate to where you and I are at exactly now in our pain and our sorrow and in our suffering. It's Jesus. And he destroyed. The amazing thing about this word destroy, the word means this. It means to render Satan inoperative or nullify Satan's authority, stripped of his badge, so to speak. He's defeated. When Christ rose again from the dead, somehow in some way there was this massive earthquake in the kingdom of hell and darkness, and Satan's powers were greatly diminished. But to think of the fact that, that death has been broken, now, if you're fixated on just physical death, you need, you need some enlightenment. Uh, because as we mentioned in one of our New Year's Eve or New Year's Day service, whatever it was, death, in many respects, is only related to this body. This body dies. But you live on. Amen. When we read Daniel a moment ago or John's gospel, you live on after your body dies. And you're conscious and you're aware. And you want to answer that question. Do you know Jesus Christ personally? It's a tremendous thing. Number two is found in verses 15 to 16. And it says, and that he, listen to this, verse 15, and uh, released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Notice the obvious, that fear acts as a captor. I'm just wondering if you would agree with that. Fear acts as a captor. According to the Bible, fear uses death to intimidate. According to the Bible, fear has been defeated. So wait a minute, we got a problem, Pastor Jack. Fear has been defeated? Yes, because if Christ Jesus yanked the keys of hell and death from Satan and broke the grave, and that when people die now as believers, they immediately open their eyes in the presence of God in life. But those who don't, immediately open their eyes up in a Christless eternity. Think of that. That the awesome truth of the matter is, after being, what, 2,000 years old, God's word announces to us that man is prone to the fear of death. Look what it says right there in verse 15. If that's not a verse for our age, I don't know what is. Fear. Warren Wiersbe, Dr. Warren Wiersbe writes, Satan, you, listen to this. In fact, he said this in 1988. 
Listen to this. Satan uses the fear of death as a terrible weapon to gain control over the lives of people. His kingdom is one of darkness and of death and is empowered by fear. And the world is swept up right now in fear. Do you, do you see it? Do you hear it? The Bible says Jesus came and broke the power of Satan and it was Satan who through all of these millennia used the fear of death to manipulate man. The things, that, in fact, Satan said it, didn't he? Skin for skin, a man will do anything to save his own skin. Satan said that in the book of Job. Fear. Has fear influenced your life? Has fear caused you to make decisions that you shouldn't have made? What has fear done in your life? How has fear controlled you? As the, as the Christian and the believer that we are in this day and age, we are to slow down, we are to pause, everybody runs to this thing or that, the latest thing, the world is operating in fear all around the world. People are panicking, and when people panic, they get hurt all the more. I'm not up on exactly what happened, but there's some famous tennis player that has now been imprisoned in Australia because of the nation is terrified of him because he came there to play some famous world championship match and um, he's not been vaccinated, so they put him in jail. They don't know what to do with him, so I don't know if that's been changed. I've not been following that story. What causes people to do this? To, and decisions that are being made Listen, I don't want to get into conspiracies and I don't want to get into agendas. I want to get into stupid. That's what I want to talk about. <laughs> stupid right now. Listen, fear causes people to make stupid decisions. Yes. It's fear. Why are you doing this? Uh, it's, it's what we've been told to do. But based on what? It's what we've been told to do. Have you stopped to think about what you're doing? Just tonight, before I came here tonight, uh, from the ad council, in other words, paid for by you and I, you and I paid for an advertisement that sweeps this nation that now you can take your five-year-old down to wherever it is and get them vaccinated, even though your kid is safe, unvaccinated. Why would they say such a thing? And on top of it, that they filed for and got clearance from the U.S. government that no pharmaceutical firm can be sued for any reason after you take the vaccine, did you know you can't sue them? Why, 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 why? Fear. Why do people respond to this? And so listen, I wrote this to myself. COVID is not what people are scared of. Yes, that's true. COVID is not what people are scared of. You know what people are scared of? They're scared of dying. Let's be honest. What's the big deal? Why is the world freaking out? We could die. Excuse me, newsflash, you're going to die. <laughs> it's going to happen. If you take that kind of logic, you should not eat processed foods. <laughs> if you take that kind of logic, you should walk home tonight. Don't use your car. Wait a minute. But walking home could be dangerous. <laughs> oh no, what should we do? We just stay here. Think about it. Lock down the building because if we do anything, we could get killed. We could die. True. Your heart could stop in the next two minutes. Do you understand? You see how si I'm being silly, but it's true. What's happening? Fear has caused us to panic. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ broke the power of fear because Satan used fear. People have been manipulated by Satan because of the fear of death, says the Bible. Right here. In Hebrews chapter 2. Remarkable. Would to God that in my life and in your life and our lives that we would realize how truly invincible we are until Christ calls us home. You are absolutely 
protected by God until he wants you home. So what, yeah, it's the until part that I'm concerned about. I remember thinking like that, and then I remember what I think God told me. Jack, just don't worry about it. You can only die so long. You don't die very long. Is that not true? Compared to life, compared to eternity? It's absolutely remarkable. But the truth is this. Have you been freed from fear? You should have no fear as a believer. It's not just a bumper sticker. It's not just a t-shirt. It's an actual theology found in the Bible. Well, I, we, we can't do Christmas with you guys. We, you know what? We can't open our church. Somebody could get sick. We can't do this because it never stops. Satan has been laughing but I thank God for you. You counter fear by giving the truth of God's word and God's word says that Jesus Christ broke the grave. Amen. Death has been defeated. Do you know Jesus? Have you been freed from fear? Yes. These things cannot contradict. They go hand in hand. Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says, regarding Jesus, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. What a statement that is. Triumphing over them in it. What does that mean? It means that Jesus at the cross in his dying by breaking the powers of hell, mocked hell in his death. In his glorious, horrific, beautiful, terrible death on the cross. He sent a message to the underworld. You have no power here. Amen. From this moment on, I have come to my children and I've taken the same fashion as they flesh and bone. I've entered into their world, not the world of angels. I've come to their world. And I became like them. That I might communicate to them my love for them and how it feels. In fact, listen, I may not... I'm, I, I'll try to get to it. I'm going to say it now. If I don't, I'll, I'll be ahead of myself. Christ associated with us in coming into this world. And the Bible tells us in this portion of scripture that he suffered like us and he's tempted like us in verse 18. And it tells us this. And the fact of the matter is, is truly awesome. It means this. That when you and I feel and think and are tempted by whatever we're going through. You know what he's, is, he's saying to you, but we don't often listen? He's saying, I know exactly what you're going through. Jesus, I'm hurt, I'm broken, my friends have abandoned me, this, that, or the other, the family's turned on me, or, or the work, or the life, or the sickness. Or the, and you know what, when we calm down, according to the word of God, he says in verse 18 to us, I know he doesn't even say to us, you know, 2,000 years ago, I remember what that felt like. He knows now exactly what you're going through. Amen. He is God who not only felt it then, he feels what you're going through now. Well, the world talks about empathy and sympathy. Honestly, I don't know about you, but I never, I never struggled with that issue, those issues, because frankly, I've been a Christian a long time, and I've never gone to the world expecting empathy or sympathy from the world. Come on. Well, you know what? We need to make, no, no, are you, just, come on, really? You're expecting to get those kinds of godlike things from the world? Forget about it. Get it from him. And, and listen, and, and he doesn't give it a little bit, by the way. I mean, he dumps it on you. Because he knows exactly how it feels. The third thing that we see in verse 17 is this. Have you found yourself a priest yet? You think about that. Look at verse 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, like us. That he might be a merciful and faithful, look at it, high priest in things pertaining to God. Oh boy, listen. 
The word things means all things. The word actually means everything, all kinds, all men, all respects, constantly and continually, entirely, all things. <laughs> There's nothing that he can't comfort you about. And then the word here, made, he was made. What does that mean? It means that he came into skin like us that he might feel. And this is amazing. It's all without sin, though. Jesus didn't have a sin nature, yet he was tempted. The real temptations, but without a sin nature. That's to take nothing away from his ability to relate to you. This is the remarkable miracle of the incarnation that God would become skin. So that when he comforts you, he knows exactly how to comfort. You say, well, but I'm not being comforted. Listen, when we, I, me, us, when we're not comforted, it's because we're not allowing ourselves to be comforted. Right. If a little kid stubs his toe and he runs around the room screaming and crying and thinking that the world's coming to an end, he's not going to be comforted. In fact, his little heart rate's going to go up more and he's going to get blood all over the carpet. What you want to do is pick him up and hold him until he basically surrenders. And then the calm begins to pass from you to him. God does that with us. But God, I feel, I know. But this hurts God. I know, I, I know. And he helps you in the moment, in the now you don't have to go to a priest. You don't have to call a priest. You know when I say priest, I'm not picking on priest. I'm, I'm putting myself in there too, or for that matter, anybody else. According to the Bible, you've got one high priest. Watch this. Why would you go to a, a lower level priest? <laughs> the Bible says he's the high priest. He represents you before God the Father. Why would you go to uh, uh, St. Bernard or St. <laughs> Saint, uh, help me out here. I, why? Listen, honestly, with all due respect, Mary was, Mary was no doubt an, um, an awesome, remarkable, precious, beautiful young teenager who loved the Lord. Okay, but remember, Mary in her Magnificat said that the Lord has smiled down upon her and she calls him his save, uh, her savior. Protestants, we have, we have, we're guilty of, of either never mentioning Mary or beating up on Mary because we overreact to the Catholic uh, attempt to deify Mary. There's no deification of Mary. She's not a co-redemptor, like many believe. She didn't die on a cross. In Italy, there's, I think it's, forget what avenue it is or what uh, piazza it is, but there's a place in Rome where Jesus is on the cross. On one side and Mary is crucified on the other side of the cross. That's not true. Jesus died for you. And God, yes, Mary was precious and God picked her to come into this world through her. And that's, that's amazing. However, you need one high priest. You can go to him 24 seven. He knows what you're gonna say before you say it. So, so why would you confess to someone who you're gonna shock and surprise when you can go to Jesus who already knows what you're going to say because he knows what you were thinking or what you did. Amen. And you go to him. And listen, the relationship with him changes you from the inside out, not from the outside in. Amen. He's your priest. And according to the Bible in verse 17, it's essential. It is an emphatic. It means that Jesus Christ, that he had to be made like us, his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest pertaining to the things of God. Listen, we've got to wrap this up. Are you guys all sitting down? Yeah. Which, because this needs to be marked. This will freak you out. And I hope it just freaks you out so that it causes you to study the Bible. Watch this. Are you ready? Verse 17. Look in your Bibles. Therefore, in other words, get this. Don't miss it. In all things... 
he had to be made like his brethren. Meaning, if lost sinners were going to be saved, this is what had to happen. Right? It means God couldn't send an angel to do it. He couldn't find a good man to do it. If mankind was going to be redeemed, this is how it has to be. In other words, this is what's acceptable to God the Father regarding the sinfulness of man. There has to be a mediator between the two. Hang on to your shorts. Here we go. <laughs> that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest pertaining to the things of God. Do you know what's pertaining to the things of God? Watch this. Watch everybody. Mankind is a sinner. Mankind is lost. And even though God loves us, we are condemned because of sin. Before we ever wake up to the realization that we need God, we are already a sinner. Over here, God is holy, pure, spirit, and righteous. When Jesus went to the cross, died, and rose again from the dead, he brings us, the lost, mercy. Amen. Pertaining to God. He grants to us the mercy that comes from God. But there had to be a price paid to provide it. I put, I'll put it in, uh, not so accurately, but bluntly. To receive such mercy of such value, somebody had to pay for it. But nobody could. Only God could. Because he's the one whose life was valuable enough to pay. Are you, do you see this? That's why it's a gift. He gives this mercy. Here you go now. Come on, watch this. When it says that he was faithful, merciful and faithful, the word faithful means faithful pertaining to God, representing God. So what does this mean? It means Jesus never failed to perform the will of the Father. Okay, so here it is. Man is lost. God is unapproachable because he's holy. He loves us. Christ becomes one of us so that the law could be fulfilled, the prophecies fulfilled, that you and I, in the here and now, can have a compassionate, faithful high priest who we can go to directly at all times, Amen. who'll never leave us. Amen. You don't have to go to him. He's with you. Amen. In doing this, watch. Jesus Christ died for sinners. In doing this, Jesus Christ died for God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son. You see, what do you mean? On this side, Jesus died for lost sinful man. He paid the price. On this side, Jesus Christ died to fulfill the word of God. Are you with me? Jesus died for both God and man. One needed to be redeemed and the other had made the promises. It's only in Jesus that the promises and the redemption are experienced. Amen. There's no other. Friend, there's no other. Oh, but you know what? Call the priest. Call the priest. Maybe the last rites. No. Nowhere in the Bible. You need Jesus now. Amen. You need him now. You need him now. He's your priest. Do you know him? Oh, your life's prophetic, all right. All of us will live forever. Where will you live? We end here. Verse 17 and 18. Have you been comforted in these days? It says in verse 17 that he came to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Verse 18 says, for in that he himself has suffered and being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. What an amazing God to confess to someone and they say, oh, oh wow, Whew. how could you? Yikes, that's a big one. You need to do seven of these and five of the others and nine and a half dozen of the three and that thing. No, are you with me? I'm not, listen, I know I'm being sarcastic, but I'm trying to jar your thinking. If a human says, you sinned, you did what? 
Well, let me hang on. Let me look at the scale. That's over here. Um, section A11. You've got to do 17 of those things. Versus you go to God and you say, Lord, the truth is, I did this, I said this, or I thought this, it was wrong. I'm ashamed, and I ask you to forgive me. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess to him our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, listen, he's faithful. So you don't, you don't confess to someone who themselves need to confess. That's what the book of Hebrews, don't worry, hey, there's a chapter coming, we'll get there, where it says, why talk to a priest who himself must offer his own offerings for his own sins that he has committed? Don't go to any earthly priest. Go directly to the high priest, Jesus Christ. And listen, the truth is, here we are in this brand new year, and I look back, and I can tell you over the last couple years, Jesus, in all of these dynamics, and all of these things, I have never once not been comforted by him. Amen. Listen, with all the drama of the, of the world and all the stuff that's, look, listen, I don't know, you guys are here and I'm grateful for you, but not, everybody, not everybody's happy about us. <laughs> and a lot of people don't like me and some people have expressed to me what they would like to do to me if they see me. Listen, that doesn't rattle me. God's got that stuff. Listen, I'm dead serious. Listen, here's, here's the deal. Here's the thing. Not once did he leave me uncomfortable. Not once did God leave me abandoned. Not once. We were never scared. You weren't scared. But the world out there is trying to pressure you. If you have a sore throat, oh no. Psst, got news for you. You've had a sore throat every year for all the years of your life. Yeah. Uh, right? right? What you want to do? Take care of yourself. Wash your hands. Uh, listen, certainly it's very, very clear that one of the messages that we need to take away is people just being smart, is that we need to eat better. We need to take care of our temples that God gave us. We need to lay off the potato chips and Pepsis. <laughs> A lot of people have suffered because they were not healthy. So let's learn from that. But let's know this. God's word is true and he will comfort us through everything. So the answer to the question, is your life prophetic? Oh, yes, it is. But where will you live it in eternity? Do you have a high priest? I have a high priest tonight. I'm not bragging or boasting, but I got one. He's amazing. And you can have him too. I, we will share him with you. But if you don't have him, you ain't got nothing. You have no safety in that. You're walking on a line of silk over a fire. And... If I get COVID and die, I go to heaven. Or if I get hit by a truck that's carrying vaccines, I, I go to heaven. Right? I know that was a, I don't know why I even thought that thought, but could you imagine? How'd he die? He got hit by a truck carrying vaccines. I might have to repent of that thought. I have to think about that for a while. I didn't mean that to be like that. The, 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 we have to get serious now. What's, oh, we're done. Eternity's just, just past your nose right now, friend. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Even though you may not even know him, I want, you to, I want to introduce him to you. He died on the cross for your sins. He knew all about you. He knew all about your life and all the stuff that you've gone through. He knows all about it. And all that stuff that you hate about your life or that you're hurt about your life, he wants to 
restore you, and renew you. And don't be surprised if he takes those horrible things and in the not too distant future, he makes them incredible powerhouses yes. in your life so that you later on say, I wouldn't change a thing. He's that good. Yes. Father, we pray tonight, Lord. We ask you, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would speak to those that are here right now, maybe those that are viewing, that tonight is the night that they would say, Jesus, come into my life. I, I've had an earthly priest all my life, but this makes sense. We're talking about heaven here. We're talking about eternity. Why would I talk to an earthly priest? I want to go to my heavenly priest. I want to go to the high priest, Jesus. And so tonight, my friend, whoever you may be, wherever you may be, would you say to him right now, Lord, forgive me of my sins? I believe you died for me and you rose again from the dead and I want to become a follower of yours. I want you to take my life and use it for the reason why you gave me life. Cause my world, cause my life, if I'm seven years old or 97 years old, whatever time is left for me in my life, Lord, will you take my life and use it to your glory? In whatever that means. But I come as a humbled, broken sinner asking you to save me, to wash me clean of my sins, and you're asking him to write your name in his Lamb's Book of Life. My dear friend, if you're serious about that right now, God is hearing your heart, God is listening to you, and Christ moves in, and he's doing it now in some of your lives and he's gonna start magnifying himself more and more. You may not feel anything, you might feel something, it's irrelevant. God's word is true, your need is real, and Christ is here. And he loves you. God loves you. And he wants to start having you live life now, finally, after all these years. It's time to live. Glory be to God.